Father, you know what, what we need to hear today. You know the words um, that you want us each to take in. God, um, show, us, show us what you want us to know about your word, and we thank you so much for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, open up your book to the very first section. There's like a little part called the introduction, and it's fast and quick, and we're gonna move quickly. It's page I-1, and you can read. I'm pretty sure you can read. So you can read through some of this later, but there's a couple things I wanted to point out. Um, Our class format mentioned before, each of your lessons is made up of five days of homework, okay? So you have two days off, yay, yay, right, okay. Do it however you want. Like some people sit and do the whole thing at once, some people like break it up. I just wanted, I needed it to be broken up for my own personal self. Um, Those sections are gonna um, be pretty easy to get through. There's usually about seven to 10 questions on each day. Don't get mad at me, be nice to me, okay? I'm a wordy person, have you figured that out yet? (laughs) Yeah, you're like, yeah, she's super wordy, yeah. So some of the questions, when you look at the page, you're like, holy cow, what? Don't be intimidated, just do what you can. Because when you come back each week, you'll see under class format, the second part, when you go into that group discussion, you're gonna talk about your homework, but they're not gonna cover every question, okay? We're just gonna pick, select some, and you're gonna go through some highlights when you go through the discussion. So don't stress about it, don't make it a stressful thing, make it a joyful, awesome thing, and just spend time with him. And you know what, I do I do this all the time. I, I always forget that I can ask God for things like, Hey God, open my schedule. This is a really good prayer. You're gonna love hearing this from your Bible study teacher. Hey God, make me want to study this today. I mean, it's okay. It's it's okay, because there's some days you look down at this and you're like, I don't, I don't know. I don't wanna do this. And so I ask him, I'm like, hey, I am struggling today. Will you make me want to want to? Okay, so just pray about it. He'll make the time, it happens. It's really super weird, okay? You think you're really busy and all of a sudden you realize, man, I'm on Instagram a lot. <laughs> you know, you start going, hmm, I can, t-. it's, it, you'll find time, I believe it. Teaching sessions, um, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be in here first. I did wanna tell you this, and this book has a different website, but you can know this. If you will go to Rock Point Church's uh, YouTube page, or you can go to this website, that's my website, The videos are gonna be uploaded every Friday, okay? So Wednesday we're in here, and then Friday you're gonna have a video access because sometimes you can't be here. And so so if you wanna stay up to speed on what we taught that week, you can go watch the video at home, okay? There's that. Okay, turn the page over to page I-2. Study guidelines at the top, that really small little section. Okay, Couple things I wanna point out, and then we're gonna go into the background of Ecclesiastes before we take off to our small groups today. I wanna point out that what we do in these Bible studies is we really, really want you to focus on what is God telling you? What is he teaching you? You know, when you you consult commentaries, and by commentaries I mean, you can see I gave a few examples, sermons or podcasts or teachings or books or online resources, or even like, okay, don't get mad, bless your heart, right? If your Bible is, is, is so pretty and lovely and it's really big and thick and then you open it up and it has all of the scripture stuff up here and then down underneath it has what? Notes. Aren't they the best, those notes? Like if you have a life application Bible or a study Bible or something, those notes are fantastic. They're also commentaries. <laughs> And so what I, I just, they're not bad, they're great, but I wanna suggest to you, which is why I bought a Bible with no notes, because it's too tempting to me to go down and read. Okay, I read that scripture, now I'm gonna read down here what this smart guy says, okay? I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you when you go through the homework, read it in your Bible or your Bible app or whatever, and then don't consult commentaries until after you're finished, until after we're done with the whole lesson. Let God show you let him tell you, because here's what happens. It happens for me. If I immediately go to my commentaries, um, the notes in my Bible or, or my pastor's sermon on Sunday, and I go, oh, well, he said this, or these notes said this, then it's a lot harder for me to hear what God's showing Chris. Does that make sense? And so when we say here in the study guidelines, we want you to avoid consulting commentaries. We just mean avoid it when you're doing your study time. After you come to class, man, go home and listen to all the podcasts and all the land, okay? And hear what they have to say, because it's fascinating. Because let me tell you this, I'm a commentary as well. Like when I get up here and speak, there's gonna be some things where you're like, 
okay, I, I haven't heard it that way. And so I invite you to bring questions to me because again, I'm gonna be sharing my point of view, but sometimes God has things to show you that are different than what he shows me. Does that make sense? So we do highly recommend using the tools that are in your Bible. There's a lot of cool things you can use. You know, I studied, I'm like 25 years old now, so I'm so grown up. The front row laughed. The rest of you, don't kiss up on day one. I know I'm not 25. Um, it took me a minute, you know? I've been a Christian for a while. I've studied my Bible for several years. I didn't look at a map in the back of my Bible. I was like, what is, who is that for? Who does that, what are these things? But I wanna tell you, as a geeky Bible study nerd, that you can now become, um, there's a lot of really cool tools that you have in your Bible that we probably don't even look at. Like there's a concordance in the back and there's a subject index. And let me tell you, you know my favorite tool in my whole Bible? The front row knows. My favorite tool in the entire Bible. I was a technical writer by trade, by the way, in case you wondered. My favorite tool is the table of contents. It's the best. And, and I'm telling you, you're gonna be in Ecclesiastes, which is in the Old Testament, if you wanna you know, feel real smart and just like open straight up to it. It's just right, right after Proverbs and it's all in that Psalmsy Song of Solomon area, it's over there. But here's the thing, you're gonna be flipping around. There's gonna be times in this very first lesson that you go home and do, lesson two, we're gonna look at the background about the author who wrote Ecclesiastes and I'm gonna have you jumping all over the place. So use your table of contents, it's okay. It's so rewarding for a technical writer to feel used by you. So please do it. Um, but what you can know is in the back of your book, there's an appendix. And what I've tried to do over the years is to, I've tried to kind of include some suggested tools that you can use as you're studying. Um, some websites, there's some supplemental tools. So just take a look when you have some time and see what you think. And that might help you as you go through studying. Um, well, let's do this. Take a look at your, well, let's skip this. Okay, so go to page 2-1 in your book. I wanna show you something real quick. 2-1. So when you go home today, you're gonna to go home and you're gonna work on this lesson. And what you can see is that you can see how I've broken it out by five days of homework. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Five days. And so what you'll do is do this homework. There's a lot of words in there because I write a lot of words. Again, I'm wordy. It's totally fine if you wanna skip some of those. And then when you come back, you're gonna talk about them, okay? And then when you come back, I'm gonna talk about them. And that's how it's gonna look every week. Does that make sense? Okay, and if you have any questions, man, just please feel free to ask your small group leader. They'll probably be able to answer them for you, but I feel like it's pretty straightforward and um, I, think you're gonna, I think it's gonna make sense. Um, but right now, what we are gonna do for this first class is we're gonna turn to page 1-1 and you'll see I got a big blank page there that says lecture notes. And I try to include that every single week so that if you wanna take notes, or again, if you're gonna take a nap, fine, it's a pillow, use it, I don't care. Um, but gives you a space to take some notes if you want to when we're talking about um, Ecclesiastes. This week, what we're talking about is just the background. You see, when we study the Bible at this, at this church, one of the things we always try to remember is like, we gotta see what it actually really says. We gotta see who it was actually written to and then we get to take it and apply it to like our lives today in 2022. Like, what does this mean to me? Sometimes I think women, I think people get it all mixed up, don't we? We go to God's word and we're like, tell me something about me. And God's like, I wanna tell you about me. And so we're gonna read it that way. We're gonna see what the word says. We're gonna understand the context of how it's written. And then that way, hopefully, what we'll then be able to be rewarded with is some sort of application that we can take with us. Does that make sense? All right, before we dig in, I have a question for you. You can write this down in your notes. I, I want you to write this down because I want you to think about this whenever, whenever we're going through this study and we get towards the end and you're looking back and you're like, I don't even know. Um, I don't even know what questions I'm supposed to ask. I don't even know what I'm supposed to answer. I want you to remember this one question, okay, this one thing. And here's the question. Are you free Am I free? You can write that down. Am I free? I thought about that this week, not when I was doing live reading in Ecclesiastes, but when I was doing some reading in the book of John, 
Um, and if you study God's word, you know that in the right-hand side of the Bible is the New Testament, and that's where Jesus shows up with skin on, like he's on the earth walking around, okay? And the first couple of books there are the Gospels, and they tell the story of Jesus. And in, in John chapter 8, verse 32, there's this amazing verse, and it has just hung with me this week, and I thought, maybe we need to hear it today. And the verse is this. It says, Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? set you free. The truth will set you free. What we're about to study is truth. It's, it's God's word. It's his ordained word. He penned this thing with King Solomon. Oh, I just gave that away. We'll pretend like we didn't know that he's the one that wrote it. But I would challenge you with this. I ask you to ask yourself, am I free? But I want to challenge you with something else. If, if you're not free, if you don't feel like you're living a life that is free, isn't it logical to then ask, what are you believing? Are you believing things that are not true? Because I think what we can infer from Jesus's words is that truth sets us free. And so if we are not free, then we are believing things that are not true. You are gonna see over the course of studying this Old Testament book of wisdom that, it, that, that, that the author just wants us to know some things. He wants us to understand some things about freedom. He wants us to understand some things about the author, the author of everything, of God, right? It's a book that is inclusive and universal which is weird, right, to say at a Bible study, but it is. This book is so fascinating because it's gonna ask big questions that everyone has, whether you know Jesus as your savior or whether you don't, and you've never even opened God's word. These are questions that are universal, okay? Everyone asks them. He's gonna hit those. This is a book that um, is about having it all. It's about striving for what the world tells you will satisfy you. And we can all relate, every one of us. It's a book about reflecting on the meaning of life. Some authors say this is the most philosophical book in, in God's word, in the Bible. Fascinating, right? And this is a book that's gonna challenge whether or not we're truly free. A couple of quotes about the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, let me ask this. Has anybody like studied Ecclesiastes? I don't mean just heard a sermon about it, but like really like dug in and studied. If you have, raise your hand. A couple people. And you notice the way they raise their hand? They raise their hand like this. <laughs> In other words, don't come ask me about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's challenging. And I wish I could stand up here and say to you, we're about to study something. You're going to get all the answers. But you know what it is? You're about to study something that you're going to ask all the questions. And it's beautiful. And I love when God does that to us, when he makes us struggle a little bit, when he makes us dig, when he makes us doubt, right? Because it strengthens what sets us free. A couple quotes as I was going through it, I thought these were such good ways of, of, of explaining kind of what we're about to walk through. Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans said this about Ecclesiastes, every one of us has struggled with the deep questions of life, an untimely death, illness, loss of job, financial problems, marital problems, all of these questions that cause us to be anxious and many times discouraged in life, this book tells the story of the only man who has ever actually lived and had every single thing the world had to offer. Money, wisdom, pleasure, everything. And he came to the conclusion that those things cannot satisfy. Another author wrote this about the book of Ecclesiastes. One thing Ecclesiastes doesn't do is try to give you all the answers. You're all like, why am I here today? <laughs> Hang with me. Some books are like that. They admit their limitations. Ecclesiastes is not the kind of book that we read. We keep reading until we reach the end and get the answers like a mystery. Instead, it's a book in which it keeps us struggling with the problems of life as we struggle. But we learn to trust God with the questions when we do not have all the answers. This is how the whole of Christian life works. It's not about what we get at the end but it's about the people that we become along the way. Wow, right? Deep. Well, the way we normally approach when we study one of these books is we start with the context and we start with the background. I wanna give you a platform that you're gonna start from, okay? So you're gonna have an understanding walking into 
verse one, I mean, chapter one, verse one, you're gonna go, okay, I know some things already about the book of Ecclesiastes. And so we're gonna answer some questions, okay? And I'm gonna move quickly through them. Um, you don't have to write down everything, but I just want you to have an understanding. First question is this, who wrote Ecclesiastes? And I kind of said a minute ago, it was King Solomon, but I wanna share a little bit of detail with you about this, okay? There are different opinions. Technically, it's anonymous. He never says, hey, I'm the guy who wrote this book, okay? A lot of, all of the books in the Bible are that way. They, they, they're technically anonymous, but what we do is we piece together history and facts and things, and it gives us hints, okay? And so this is one of those. There are really kind of two opinions. Most Christians and Jews have traditionally attributed this to King Solomon, and there's some reasons why. I'll go over those in a minute. But then there's another opinion that some scholars believe that it was a later king um, because of some of the language that's used. There's some exile language used, and so historically it kind of matches up, and they call that the second Solomon, okay? If people believe that this other king wrote about it, he writes it from a perspective that's kind of autobiographical later, like he kind of writes it as though he's talking about Solomon. Is that clear? Okay. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna land with the King Solomon. I just feel like there's too much that makes sense that he's the author of, okay? So that's where we're coming at it from that perspective. But just know we don't know 100% certainty. It doesn't change the truth of this, of this book. There's a couple of reasons. The main reasons that scholars believe that it was Solomon is the first is that the titles fit. Okay, you're gonna see when we open it up that he's gonna refer to himself as the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. He's gonna refer to himself as king over Jerusalem. And that's what Solomon was, okay? We also believe that, um, that his life experiences line up with Solomon, that there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of wealth, and that goes right in line with what we historically know about King Solomon. And the third thing that we know, that we, that we really believe that Solomon wrote this is because of his role, okay? He taught many people he wrote a lot of things. The whole book of Proverbs, have you, if you've never even studied your Bible, you've probably heard of the Proverbs. You've probably quoted some of them or Instagrammed them and you, know, you don't even know. But it's this entire collection of wise sayings, wise teachings, and Solomon was the author of that. And so we see consistency in who he was and so we tend to believe that that's who wrote this, okay? Now, there's something kind of interesting about this, and, and you're gonna see it when you open it up in chapter one, this is the first chapter, and then the last chapter, chapter 12. You're gonna see some references. It's kind of like a third person kind of thing. It's like referring to like a narrator, and, and I, the word for that is koheleth. That's the word used, and it's actually a derivative. The word Ecclesiastes is actually a derivative of that, but that word means preacher or teacher. So in your Bible translation, you're not gonna have that Koheleth, that you're gonna have the word preacher, or some of your Bibles have teacher, okay? And so what you can know is that just means one who speaks to the congregation. And so what, what the author does, author separate from the Koheleth dude, okay? The author's gonna speak about this preacher teacher in chapter one and chapter 12. Don't be confused by that because we tend to believe it's the same person. It's just him kind of telling a story and kind of making it more of a narrative, okay? We'll talk about it more when we get there. We also know this about um, Solomon, that he wrote other wisdom literature in the Bible. He wrote the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, it may be in your Bible. And that was from a royal perspective about marriage and about love. He also, I mentioned before, he wrote Proverbs and that was all about wise teaching. And Ecclesiastes, we look at it this way, that it's more like a presenting or debating um, from many different viewpoints. It's very philosophical in nature and it's a lot of retrospect. Like we believe that he probably wrote it later in life and is looking back on his life and making all these statements about that, okay? So that leads us right into the next question. When was it written? Um, we believe based on the facts of how he speaks and what we know about history that was probably written no later than 931 BC, 931 BC, which is later in his life. It's written kind of like, you can, you can read it kind of like a memoir. You know, he's kind of, you'll see some things that he talks about, especially after you go through your homework this next week, so I'm gonna give you all kinds of background about him, okay? But you're gonna see um, through these words of Ecclesiastes how he wandered from God how he fell into tragic sin. 
And you're gonna see how he then repented and turned back to God. Ecclesiastes is that experience. It's that wisdom that he's sharing with us. And you know what that says to me? God doesn't waste anything. He wastes nothing. Like this guy, this king who had everything, he went dark. But God doesn't waste it. And so I think it's hopeful. It's hopeful for me. It's hopeful for you that there's so many places in our lives, right, that we want to just kind of, do we just want to hide them back in the corner and pretend like they didn't happen? But we can remember that just like King Solomon, God can use even the dark and the dirty and the messy. Amen. There's hope. Well, so we think we know who wrote it. We think we know when it's written. To whom was it written? It's interesting because when you, when you read this, just know this, it's for you. It's for me. It's for us. But it wasn't written to us. Okay, that's an important distinction. I think I learned that when I was reading the Bible one time. I'm like, wait, not every single part of this is dear Chris? No, it's not. And some of them are very specifically written to people or people groups, but then we can glean knowledge and wisdom and, and learn about love and truth of God through it. Make sense? And so Ecclesiastes was written to young people, future generations. You'll hear his language over and over. He's talking about the future generations of his kingdom, but not to the exclusion of them. It's not just for them. It's not this private little thing. It's for all of us. In fact, we'll talk about it when we get there. He even uses a name for God. If you study God's word very much, you know that there's a lot of different names for God in the word of God. And one of them is Elohim, okay? And that means mighty God, God of creation, sovereign God, okay? That's like kind of the whole like the big, you know, he did all the things God. But then there's this one term, Jehovah. And that's like this super intimate name of God. That name of God means Lord, the God of the covenant. So God's people would understand that word. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon never uses the the phrase Jehovah. He uses Elohim because he's very mindful of the fact that there are people at that time, at our time, who might be reading this that may not know God. They may not. And so it's kind of neat when you see that, you're like, oh, I love this. It's just outreach. We're seeing outreach happen right here. That's who it was written to. Um, What style was it written? It's, I mentioned before, it's Old Testament wisdom literature. It deals with the way of the world and it's like a philosophy of sorts. I've heard it quoted, um, somebody quoted, said that they called this the thinking man's book in the Bible. I've heard, it, I've heard it explained as a journey. It's a reflective and transitional kind of autobiographical thing. And then I found this quote, and I thought this was, just, this was so right on. Ecclesiastes does not flow smoothly. It meanders and it jumps and it starts through general messiness of the human experience to which it is a response. That there is always an intermingling of poetry and prose the whole time. Like we're gonna get to parts of it and you already know one part of it. I think it's in chapter three that's very poetic. It's even a song. But you know, and then there's parts where it's like, what, we're not doing poems anymore? We're, you know, it's going back and forth. But I love it because it does reflect and and it's like holding a mirror up to our lives, right? Never clean and neat and orderly. It's always messy and bumpy. And that's what this book is. Um, You're gonna see words over and over and over in this book. And I love that because whenever we see something repeated, it's like God like bolding and highlighting. You know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna say this again and then again and then again because you're not gonna hear it. And so a lot of these words you're gonna see over and over are gonna give you direction to what the themes are gonna be, like what we're gonna learn. You're gonna see this term, vanity of vanities. You're gonna see that all the time. You're gonna see that 38 times. In the Hebrew, the word is hevel, hevel, hevel. And basically it just means everything is futile, everything is meaningless. Now don't be all down and out about it. It's not, it seems really depressing when you hear that. You're like, cool, great Bible study, guys. You look at your friend, thanks for bringing me. (laughs) Nah, it's okay. Because then he talks about the other things in life, the joys and all the great things that life has to offer too. So don't be overwhelmed by that. He just puts it in perspective. You're gonna see words like under the sun, like 29 times you're gonna see the author say that. That means life now. 
life before we go on and we're in heaven under the sun. You're gonna see that a lot. You're gonna see words like prophet, labor, man. You're gonna see the word man, AKA Adam, like 40 something times. You're gonna see the word evil 30 something times. Wisdom, God, excuse me, God. You're gonna see all these words repeated over and over because he's trying to make points for us to understand, okay? So watch for them. Watch for the things you start seeing over and over. Well, the last thing I wanna hit before I turn you loose is we wanna talk about the central themes of Ecclesiastes. And just in this little talk right now, you've probably figured out some of them. Um, There are a lot. You're gonna see a lot of little underlying themes. You're gonna see big overarching themes. The key aim here in in this book is to help us um, address a lot of life's most challenging questions for believers and non-believers. In other words, we're gonna see King Solomon say to us, hey, don't do what I did. Don't do what I did. Learn from what I did. Don't do it. I wrote down three. I kind of, I summarized it as best I could because like I said, you're gonna see a million different themes and I can't wait to hear what you see because I feel like every one of us reads God's words with the filter of our own lives, right? And so it's like, things are gonna stand out to you that are different. But three things I wrote down that I think all of us are really gonna see and the first is this, that all earthly pursuits, all of them, okay? I'm talking goals, comforts, plans, jobs, possession, status, health, beauty, reputation, cute shoes, all the things, okay? They will never satisfy. They will produce only emptiness like chasing after smoke. All earthly pursuits ultimately will not satisfy you. What you keep trying to put in the place that God says, that's my place, We keep trying to stuff all these things in it and God's like, ain't never gonna work, guys. That's the first theme that you're gonna see. The second is this, that we all have the same fate. Whether you believe or you don't believe, we all have the same fate fate, that death will come and subsequent judgment by God will come. It's just fact. Every one of us, no matter how we lived, no matter what we did, no matter how focused we were, or how many Bible studies we came to, or how many times we went to church, or how many times we didn't, are gonna stand before the throne of God and have to look him in the eye and say, this is what my life was about, and this is what I believed. And the third major central theme that you're gonna see in Ecclesiastes is this, that enjoying life can only be truly experienced when you tether it to faith and obedience that enjoying life can only be truly experienced when you tether it to faith and obedience. You see, there are amazing things in this life, amen? We're not gonna sit in here every week and be like, oh, everything's terrible, vanity of vanities. You know, What we're gonna do is go, man, there's great stuff out there. There's amazing stuff. And he wants us to enjoy it. Hear that, you, you serve and love and know, I hope, a God who wants you to enjoy this life. There's purpose in this life but it has to be tethered to faith and obedience, otherwise it's empty. What would Solomon say if he were standing in here right now? What would he say? I always think about um, our our pastor, Ron. I've heard him give um, memorial services before and he's asked this question. He said, what do you think this person that we're honoring would say to you about God today? If she or he could come back today and stand here, what do you think they would say? And I always thought that was such an amazing question because you know, no matter if you're a believer or not a believer, you're gonna have something to say after you go on past this life under the sun. You're gonna have an opinion. And I feel like that's what Solomon's doing to us. He's saying, if I could come back today, I would tell you this is real and this is true and he loves you, and he wants joy, and he wants happiness, but more than that, he wants you to know him, because otherwise you will not be free. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are you free? I think we're gonna get to answer that question as we go through Ecclesiastes together. Um, Later in that chapter, in John chapter eight, there's another part, and I'm gonna read the whole thing together so you can get a context, but I love this last line. Verse 31, John 8, verse 31 starts like this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you right. 
And then they answered him and said, we're the offspring of Abraham and we have never been enslaved by anyone. How is it that you say that we will become free? They thought they were free, right? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. A slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And this is the part that just gets me. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, we're gonna learn through the words of Ecclesiastes, through the words of King Solomon, that there are so many things that we try to set ourselves free with, and there is only one way to be free. And that's through Jesus Christ and a faith in him. You're gonna see it. The Old Testament, Jesus ain't walking around with skin on yet, but boy, every page points to him. And I cannot wait for that to unfold for you too. And so will y'all pray with me? And Father, we thank you so much for this amazing book. We thank you for this um, incredible, gosh, it's a challenge. We see the challenge, but I love that you give us the opportunity to love you with our whole heart, mind, and soul. And so God, show us how to love you well. And Father, we pray that um, you make clear the things that we need to face, the questions, the philosophical questions, the, that we try to ignore because we don't wanna deal with them. Lord, will you bring them to the surface? Will you show us what you want us to examine through the book of Ecclesiastes? And I thank you, Father. Thank you for the willingness of those in this room and even those who couldn't be here today, God. Will you just, will you like rock their worlds by giving them time? Will you just open up these amazing moments where they have time with you? And will you remind them how merciful you are and how loving you are? And we remind them that um, you want joy for them, but you want them to find joy tethered to faith and obedience in you. And so Father, show us how to do that. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this place and to study your word, God. Thank you for leaving it for us. And it's in your precious son who gave us life. It's in his name that we pray, amen.